Okay. Hi, hi, Fabian. Um, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna start. Everybody, um, you know, it's my my pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Dr. Fabian Thies. Uh, Fabian has had a very long history of creatively applying mathematical models to uh, to systems biology problems. He currently leads the Institute of Computational Biology at Helmholtz Munich and is also a professor in the Department of Mathematics at Technicum University Munich. So I uh, first came to know of Dr. Athese's work through his many wonderful methods uh, for single cell data. I think uh, many of you know of his work. It's very hard not to know his work if you work on single cell data. Uh, his group has developed um, the SCANP platform uh, in Python uh, for large scale single cell analyses, which I, like many of you, are a very big fans of. Uh, he has also done uh, pioneering work on applying deep learning methods for information extraction in single cell data, uh, including packages like DCA and SCGen. And he has also developed the diffusion pseudo time for lineage reconstruction that set standards for later work. There's just, you know, such a long list of his contributions to this field. I'm not going to have time to list them all. Um, so today, uh, so I guess I should just hand it over to, to you, Fabian, and you can tell us about your latest work. Yeah, thanks, Nancy, for, for the kind invitation and for the possibility of being here. Um, this is my the first talk. Uh, this is my first talk in 2021. So I'm a little bit in holiday mode still, basically just being out with the kids in the snow. So uh, please excuse me when I'm a little bit, bit uh, not yet up, up to speed with recent things, but I'm very excited to sort of briefly give you an overview um, with this sort of more, more general audience introduction of why I think single cell tools and, and sort of I think methods are posing quite a fun playground for us computational biologists to, to, to work in there. And then um, highlighting a, a few, few recent uh, tools from the lab. Let me just share my screen here. I guess yeah. you can see, you should see the first slide now. Is that working out right? So I, I wanted to um, talk about how we use um, this strong variation in the data, this single cell uh, expression profiles, particular single cell RNA-seq from, from, uh, to understand cell state and then, and then also dynamics. And I prepared, Nancy, something like a 45 minute talk, but please interrupt me when I'm, I'm going over yeah, time. Yeah, okay. I should have said that. This is 45 minutes. We'll have 15 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, if you have questions, you can also just put them in chat and I'll make sure that we can get to them. Awesome. Also, if there's some some really thing that things that are unclear, very happy to just Nancy interrupt me or something like that. Don't 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 drift, just feel free. Cool. Awesome. So uh, just be, before getting started, let me briefly tell you where I'm from. I'm from uh, the Helmholtz in Munich, basically the, the computational health part of 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 that, um, coordinating this this institute of computational biology where we're doing this data based analysis and modeling. And then there's, there's a whole bunch of activities in, in Europe we've been bunching together uh, with AI machine learning type of tools in this Atlas uh, network, European machine learning uh, network. And we are actually hosting and I'm co-organizing this uh, unit, uh, unit in, in Munich, um, coordinating this, this, this data science grad school because we realized that actually getting people to work in that, that field is, is maybe not the easiest with industry actually picking up a lot of them. I'm sure many of you can relate to, to that. And then I've been recently setting up what's called the Hamholtz AI units so across, Hamholtz is sort of the largest research organization in, 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 in Germany. So across all of them, we're we trying to organize machine learning uh, and methods and, and sort of data exchange there. And then setting a bunch of, up a bunch of institutes. The gist of all of this being that there's a lot of activity at, at the moment in, in Munich for computational biology and sort of more general health based machine learning techniques. And there's a whole set of also open positions and uh, both on, on PI, senior PI, junior PI, so sort of postdoc and, and PhD level. So when interested, just reach out. Yeah, and, and actually there's some, some nice links for that. So it's about selling a state. I'm trying to understand really how we can not by fashion describe it. I came into this whole single cell biology field from time microscopy. We have been looking at a few genes at a time, but many, many cells. And that was sort of different from the bulk RNA-seq era, I would say. Well, we have usually what's in statistics called small n large p. So we didn't have very many samples. 
And back to an opportunity, you get this smoothie, and I'm sure many of you still saw this another analogy. This is adapted from, from Alex and, and Aviv's uh, a slide, where you know, in single cell genomics, you know, get the food salad out of the smoothie. So you can really, with a whole bunch of, of advances, particular miniaturizations, capture cells in, in small water droplets, lyse them, analyze them, and then with this sort of barcoding, then jointly sequence them to get live scale RNA seq out. It's been denoted method of the year in the multi omics version, method of the NH methods again uh, just, just last year. And you know, this has become really big. So when, when sort of the, the fresh papers in 2009 had just a bunch of cells, now that it's very regular, most of us, we process tens or hundreds of thousands of those cells. So that's why it's been really, I guess, one of those big data disciplines now. I think one of the very exciting ones. So uh, definitely an error for machine learning to, to, to work around. What can you do with this? It's just one example from, um, yeah, a, a sort of a, a perspective we've been uh, putting up in what's called this lifetime in, in initiative, where you try to understand cell fate in health and, and, and diseases, and sort of you could understand maybe cells of the healthy state going around this. This is just some beautiful visualization, but you get the idea that maybe in disease something goes wrong in the cells, and maybe you can do this type of trajectory learning to understand what went wrong at some point, maybe even actually. In, intervene and then get this back. So this hope from this purely descriptive type of approach that we currently do going towards a true, yeah, in interventive type of medicine. I think, I think, think it's, yeah, imagine, right? We have all of these variations and, you know, from observational data, we know that some causal stuff can be learned. I mean, there's ideas such as perturbsy and so on that actually take this one further. But I think really trying to understand what goes wrong, going maybe towards a cell-based medicine, I think is a very exciting out outlook. Um, and this European idea of uh, this big network called Lifetime is going this direction, of course, and HCA, HubMap, and so on. That's very similar approaches uh, all over the world. So going to, towards computation biology, how do we analyze these type of data? Well, we start from the sequence and just after raw processing, get a bunch of count matrices. Originally, this was like a single one, but nowadays very commonly, we do many of those matrices at the same time. And then we do some QC data correction for batch, for example, normalization, feature selection. Then we typically visualize those things. Originally, maybe you did PCA, nowadays maybe TSNI or nonlinear new map. And then you find clusters in those things. So you do annotation after pre-processing. You cluster, identify markers, <laughs> And, and then, you know, you go towards downstream analysis, such as trajectory inference, learning pseudo times. I've been speaking about that briefly, doing maybe composition analysis. Nancy, we briefly mentioned that before. We actually brought out a tool for that, uh, a Bayesian uh, compositional data analysis thing, which we call SC Coda, just a few weeks ago. Really happy to get, get, get input there, or differential expression. And this sounds very straightforward, but each of those steps actually necessitated new developments that we just weren't able to very quickly carry over from bulk RNA. Just because distributions were different, data was so sparse, there was noise, it didn't scale well. So I think in early times, this was a fun era just to transport stuff into that we know from other uh, regimes, but now also sort of, I think there's something like 70 methods for pseudo time out there just because it's, it's a fun method question. Um, my group contributed just on the sort of infrastructure side, this, this, this tool called scan Python analysis in Python, where you can now just somewhat uh, quickly do very high throughput uh, data analysis. And for example, here with 1.3 million cells uh, produced TCN. So what type of challenges do we have in, in single cell genomics? For example, cell lineage estimation, I mentioned that before. So, and, and I think it, it just demonstrates what the power uh, of, of this thing is that you maybe can't do in bulk. Say we have gene expression profiles that live in this 20,000 or so high dimensional transcript space. Maybe they, 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 they form up such a bunch, but yeah, maybe, maybe they look like that. So this is from some, some older paper that we did together with Betty Gertgens uh, already some, some time ago, Betty, Betty from uh, Cambridge, UK. And I think in this, in this case was still qPCR, was early, early blood development. And there we've been asking, if you just, in this case, just sort genes by cells and have many cells, 3,000 at the time was quite a lot, uh, just do a hierarchical clustering, you see some type of groups popping up, but you don't actually see all that much structure. So we asked in this high dimension transfer space, maybe they don't look like a big bunch. Maybe they actually live in a sub manifold as you'd like to mathematically call this. And there might be then sort of a bunch of progenitor cell, cell type here that maybe rolls down this Waddington landscape of cellular decisions and then forms maybe those two downstream cell types here. And maybe we can actually follow them through this landscape. For example, in, in, in a 
K9 graph, follow through trajectories and do similar things. If you do many, many of those random walks, maybe you can actually learn how cells transition through these things. This has been um, put forward originally, I would say, by, 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 by Coach Ripnell and, 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 and Dana Pan, these uh, two seminar papers, Monocle and, and Vandalus, beautiful name. And we've been, for example, following the diffusion pseudotime and there's been many others, essentially arranging now the, the cells by distance from this thing, essentially learning something like your geodesic distances on that, that sub manifold. And if you arrange them now by this, you order them by distance from that, just doing this on this matrix, starting from the, from maybe some pre-known original state, you suddenly get something like that. And that looks much cleaner and much more easy to interpret, where you see a bunch of cellular decisions of genes being turned on and off early on, as well as later, finding branching points and so on. So this finding lineages, just in observation data has become quite a big thing. I mentioned more than 80 or so methods out, and then big uh, comparison papers coming out then actually advising which ones to go for, for some one of ours sort of builds upon this uh, uh, graph abstraction we're actually doing a very good job so this is a fun era and just to, to, to show a little bit what what we've been been doing without now going into details and then just later show you a few vignettes we've been for example now ex extending this not just learning one step in this thing but whole big branches to do deep lineage estimation with our graph uh, abstraction type of work learning not only single cell data at one time point, but having marks about time points and asking how can you connect stuff across time points. In this case, now not yet for uh, connecting something like regulatory progress, but just seeing how populations are being pushed through this. Uh, for this, we basically came up with a population model. We've been also trying to understand QCs. We've been coming up with, 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 with tests for seeing how well data can be integrated across um, labs, conditions, and, and so on. And I, I show a benchmark that we've been recently carrying through a, a, a little bit later. And then we've been applying all, all of these tools, for example, to generate atlases. At our center, we're very much focusing on metabolic as well as uh, 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 respiratory diseases. So we've been applying this, for example, to generate a, an, an atlas for, for endocrine cells in the pancreas as well as in the intestine. And then trying to understand how you can restore better cell function and so on. This was just, this actually just came out two days or so ago. So we're very happy about that. It was like, three years of revision so we uh, worked together with the silicate lab and then uh, with the Schiller lab a uh, local lab here is where we've been actually looking into mouse and, and human lung atlas building and trying to understand uh, variation there and been basically uh, enumerating being faster in annotation and then uh, finding some specific vignettes for example for particular signaling content and so on these data sets and this actually made made uh, quite some sense last year when this, this epidemic broke out, and people have been asking what's the variation of, of, of receptors in that disease. And for example, we've just been just coming up uh, with a paper here. This was worked together with uh, Christoph Moos from Aviv Regev's lab. Um, and this was just accepted in, in, in Nature Medicine a few, few weeks ago, where we've been, where each of those columns here would be in our patient. We've been trying to ask how does receptor localization of, for example, ACE2, but then also some of the uh, later caspases, how, how, is this, how is this being distributed? across a population, we found some association. So essentially now, this thing, the single cell, the cell type variation that you can essentially get with single cell RNA-seq, now becoming such a thing as would you would do with um, this classical GWAS type of studies, really trying to look across association in bigger populations. I think this gonna be, these type of approaches is gonna be very interesting in, in the future. But today, I, I wanna show us essentially two, two, two vignettes sort of on, on the scale of, of what the type of models are, how we can approach things. I think the most common type of tool that we use in comp, comp bio, I would say in the field is essentially networks, right? We make a KNA network of, of, of the latent space, basically drawing an edge if, if expressions are similar, and then we try to analyze these things. That's how we, for example, learn the pseudotime. On sort of a bit more extreme side, we maybe just do some type of prediction, latent space learning, and I show something like that. So the more, more machine learning part, high dimension data set, all the smaller scale one, we try to maybe use systems biology dynamic models type of techniques to maybe learn something about a gene dynamic. And I show one example for that. And of course, this one sort of scales better. This one might be more interpretable. I think one of the yeah, holy grails uh, sort of meta wise in, 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 in compile, I would say is being able to integrate some of these things. So I think, for example, interpretable machine learning is, is a very hot topic. And all those latent spaces that we learn, let's be honest, right? We don't, we don't fully understand what's really driving that variation. I think that could be I mean, Nancy, we spoke about the, the, the DCA embedding and similar for SCDI. 
would be very nice to understand it, which which genes are really driving some things in, in which play, play a part or which maybe gene programs. So let me start with the right hand side with these small scale um, motives. I'm speaking about uh, uh, these, these, these velocity type approaches, right? In pseudotemporal ordering, uh, I mean, I, I, I said this before, right? You run these, these type of things on, on this, 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 this type of random box on this manifold. And then essentially you, you may be aligned points. This will be like in this small example of this jumper from, from, from a cliff. Even though we don't see a movie of this guy jumping down, just by sort of looking at the sequence, we can directly infer this process, this physical process called gravity, right? And you see that sort of this guy actually accelerates. But in physics, right, in addition to state, it's always useful to have also momentum on top of that. So how can we get access to the full phase space? In this case, momentum or velocity will be giving us those errors. For that, there's all kinds of approaches around that when you have time series, you can actually estimate something such as we with the pseudo time, uh, pseudodynamics, what is OT and so on. You can actually label things. You can add a label for newly made RNA. Then you can get the ratio of that label to the total one. Then you can get something about which genes are being you know, produced strongly, which ones are not. And we've been, for example, contributing to analyzing one of those things as SLAMSEQ uh, protocol just, just uh, a year ago. But I think one of the most popular ones is this, this RNA velocity based on, uh, I would say, similar paper from Kachenko and, and, and Linus in labs two years ago. The idea being as follows. This was, was La Manu et al. Uh, they called it Velocite, the first implementation. They observed that in single cell RNA seq both in the read based as well as UMI based, UMI based uh, uh, protocols, there's a bunch of, 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 of genes that haven't been fully spliced. You, you still find unspliced reads. And now you can say if you still have unspliced reads, if you just look at simple RNA metabolism, those things are being transcribed, then being spliced and being degraded. If there's a lot of unspliced, genes around. This means that this one is being newly transcribed. If there's very few around, this is sort of being degraded, right? So that's how you can get something about the speed of one particular transcript being made. And then we've been following this up with a full dynamical model that takes into account more information. Essentially what they've been doing is just sort of these extreme ones, the steady state ones in the site approach. We've been trying to sort of do a full model, which has some advantages. Of course, it's a bit more costly as well. It has also then some robustness disadvantages. That's such a very simple one. That was the trade off. But I think in this SC little package, it's a sort of nice implementation. You can try out all these things. And this has been taken up, I think, quite nicely. So the essential idea being we have this dynamic model and we fit it with, with the M type of algorithm. And now we have a likelihood for each gene. With this likelihood, we can actually do things. So, for example, we can find dynamic genes, right? We can rank them by likelihood. We can learn actually a latent time, like at this pseudo time, that's now shared across all our transcript. And we can also have uh, more robust implementations and so on. Let me show you what, what SC Velo can, can do. Now, I, I won't present the model. This has been uh, uh, out already for half a year, but let me just briefly uh, show you one, one, one example. In this case, we look at pancreatic endocrinogenesis. This is E15 in a, in a mouse, and you see this work together with the, with the Likert lab, um, where you have these, these sort of progenitor cells here, where NGN3 is still low, and then they transition through this one and make uh, alpha, beta, uh, delta, and epsilon cells. And you see no alpha cells are being made because they are actually being made a little bit earlier. But you see there's some cell cycling. So there's some, some type of features that work out well that if you compare them with the steady state model, this was this early approach, they, they don't come out so nicely. For example, you don't find the cell cycle as you would expect here, um, which can actually confirm with scores. But you also don't find this complex branching behaviors. You should have alpha cells branching quite a But for us, what is nice, we can actually see which genes are actually driving or at least strongly associated with the dynamics. And for example, we pick up this dynamic model, for example, CPE, which is actually known to be, and you can sort of go into some regions where it does a nice job, it doesn't do so nicely in, in the steady state model. And we can actually also learn a latent time, which tells us that those cells here, the beta cells, are actually later than the alpha cells, as you would expect, and which you don't find actually in a normal pseudo time model. So it's really useful to have this phase space information on top of the normal gene expression data. Okay, that, that, that's SCV, and people have been trying out. There's some issues with it working or not so well, for example, in metabolism and, and so on. And I think combination with metabolic labeling will be one of the future new extension. What we've been doing though, is trying to see what do we do once we have those vector fields. Mostly, we just showed, we look at those two dimensional parts. Maybe we look for phony variant genes, that, that's one aspect, but typically we don't really 
look at the global picture of, of those errors. What can you do with this error information on, on top of that? This is the idea of what we call cell rank. We call it cell rank because it follows up this page rank algorithm of, sort of going directed across uh, uh, websites for, from Google. Um, this work by Marius Lange, talented PhD in the lab, in collaboration with Dana Peers, a PhD had been visiting her lab for some time and then we came up with this really nice collaboration. The idea is we really want to make use of, of this full high dimensional vector field without this two dimensional uh, projection and, and then diffusion across those vector field components. With this, you want to identify initial as well as terminal states because you know, essentially, if you follow errors, you can know where they all point in average and where they come from. And we want to also assign them for each cell in between what the probability is to go either to this one or the other direction in, in, in those terminal cells. So we get sort of a fake probability from that. If we have robust vector field, that should be possible, right? How do we do this? Well, for that, we just look now at a transition matrix similar to normal diffusion processes, but now in a directed fashion because we have directionality, right? We look at this directed single cell transition and then we just essentially do some type of spectral an analysis uh, on top of that. So we call screen, we find those macro states, similar like what you would do with an eigenvalue decomposition. And with those uh, sort of macro states, you find the terminal as well as initial states, and then you get those fake probabilities. Initially, you're sort of not sure, and then you sort of go in one or the other direction. Can kind of make sense, and you get then the, those those self help probabilities. But how do you do that? And I don't want to go too too math or anything about it, but just like on, on on one slide briefly, what you would do is at each point, you know, get this direct transition matrix that points sort of with a higher probability in the direction of the velocity, with this directed probability matrix, you now basically look at this graph and, and, and then you get this transition matrix in this particular example that I showed you before. And if you now apply this multiple times, you essentially start with some cell maybe here and then you sort of start pushing it forward. If you apply it twice, you can take, take two steps. If you apply it 10 times, so just multiplying with this matrix pushes through this density again, for example, makes you ending up at those uh, beta cells here. So in order to find now cells that are invariant under that, the steady states will be essentially just like an eigen decomposition. But the problem, of course, is you just can't do eigen decomposition because this is not, it's not a symmetric matrix anymore, right? So now you can do some type of different decompositions, such as real Schur decomposition or some type of Kreil of Schur method. But the, what we ended up really doing is what's called then uh, uh, something from molecular dynamics, actually, where we adopted it from generalized Perron cluster cluster analysis that then really helps us finding sort of these non-symmetric type, type, type of groups. And this is what we now have in a fast implementation in cell rank, uh, which you can sort of quickly apply this. So now with, if you now apply cell rank to not only this two dimension, but to the high dimensional vector field from the example that from pancreatic endocrinogenesis that I showed you before, you can now ask, hey, which of those cell types are actually now terminal? And what you find is you find those ductal ones here. So that's basically, and not, not, nothing happening anymore, then you get those alpha, beta, and epsilon cells. And these are terminal states. You can ask what the dominant fate is in, the, in each of those. You can say, hey, for, for these cells, we're not so sure yet. Well, all of those sort of stick around here, but once they're there, they don't go ductly anymore. And then they sort of here with color, you get those different fates. You can ask, where do the alpha and beta cells come from? And for example, in this case, here, this would be the alpha cell sort of region of attractor region. This would be the beta cell attractor region. And then you can also do a, rep a coarse grained representation of that. So similar to this pseudo time type approaches that I showed you before, but now with this, yeah, again, this Paga type, type of method, this graph abstraction method, but now sort of adding cell fate probability there, where there, you know, you're still not, not so sure which of the, then they actually go, and then you start very sure. About it. So you can really reanalyze this high dimensional uh, latent space that has now both state as well as uh, velocity information in a more robust fashion. So that was, that was this sort of small scale dynamic system type of approach that we then do in a robust fashion across all the genes and thereby sort of upscale it. Let's go now towards the more, more, more high dimensional type of latent space approaches. And before I really speak, speak about latent spaces, let me tell you, I think one of the key problems uh, that the field is, is, in my opinion, currently dealing a lot with is data integration really. I think from all the discussions that we just had in the previous hour, data integration is something that many of you attempt and, at, at recent uh, conferences, the compile session was always sort of dealing, yeah, how do you integrate another modality? How do you work with across labs and so on? I think one of the nicest examples for data integration really is this human cell atlas, right? 
In the human cell atlas, we want to get something like a periodic system of elements for each of the cell types in order to get that, or we want to do this robustly across the, across the lab. To really do that, a lot of methods have been proposed, but we've been thinking, well, how do we know which one's actually good? We've been trying to do a lung cell atlas, I showed you before. We didn't actually know which one to really work with. So we've been coming up with a benchmark system to really look into that. This was worked by Malte, a postdoc in the lab. Uh, like it was actually a sort of a big lab effort. It, it, we started in the local sort of hab, lab, lab hackathon. And in, in, in the first paper, even just already looking at nine integration tasks, I should update this in the revisions actually been now I think 12 or something like that, across many different uh, um, types of tissue as, as, as well as RNA and attack. More attack data actually nowadays included as well as simulation data. And then trying after pre-processing, different type of pre-processing techniques and different type of integration techniques, either graph embedding or just feature level and different types of methods, and then scoring all kinds of things. Because you know, how do you measure that stuff is integrated? Well, you measure on one hand that of course the batch has been removed, right? I mean, that's sort of the criteria things should go for. But of course the best batch correction method would be to map everything onto a single point. So of course, at the same time, you want to see how much biological variation is actually interested is concerned. For that, we came up with a bunch of indices, I think 15 or something like that, which we actually implemented in this Skipper SCIB package that, of course, if you're interested, these things encourage you to, to use. Um, and for that, and then we've also sort of scoring method a little bit from, from usability point of view. But essentially, we came up with this type of big comparison after a lot of CPU hours, I can tell you. The reviewers really made us work in the revision. But when you compare batch and bioconservation, some things perform okay and some things sort of perform better. And this was sort of our summarized somewhat simplified recommendation plot that of course for your particular data set you can still run yourself but if you sort of don't want, want to worry too much you can sort of pick a bunch of the top top methods here you see some of those graph based methods doing a good job but then in particular also some of those um latent space new network type of methods in particular these bigger data sets actually performing much more robustly than, than some of these sort of sort of maybe more by methods that do a better job on, on lower dimension data. So, so it's really those latent spaces. So the remaining part, the remaining 20 minutes or something like that, I want to speak about latent space uh, modeling. I think this is sort of something that the machine learning field has been looking into for a long time. Representation learning, I think, is one of the big, big areas. Now, occasionally, we don't have very good predictors. So I think all the annotations on is, is somewhat too simple a prediction problem as as so in comp comparison to, to, to computer vision, that we really find good latent representation. In our case, it's really mostly unsupervised machine learning. So how do we find, how do we use unsupervised machine learning to really find those good representations? For this, I think autoencoders or other type of unsupervised neural network techniques are a very interesting area uh, to, to go into. This has started, I guess, three years or so ago. Uh, we had this, this nature communications paper as, as, as uh, a first sort of contribution to that. And we sort of parallelly submitted it to, to BioArchive with, with, with Nia Yosef, who had this SCVI, very, very, very robust, very good, good, good package uh, to essentially take gene by cell matrices, squeeze them down, blow them up again. And for example, then apply this to denoising. The trick here is this, 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 this I'm sorry to, to be here base again, if, if, but if you haven't heard it, the idea is in an autoencoder, you squeeze down, blow up, and make the output as similar as possible to the input. Similar initially, just using mean squared error or something like that. In our case, we use a negative binomial or even a zero inflated one. Practice just negative binomial is fine. And then measure how similar output is to input. If everything was linear, right, you'd just be learning in the squeeze down layer, you'd just learning, you'd be learning a, P, a, a PCA if this was mean squared error. Native binomial because we have count data, so we call it a deep count autoencoder, and because we have multiple layers here, there's a non-linear representation. This denoising was a nice application, but what I think for me stuck most, and that's how we've been following this up mostly, was actually that this bottleneck layer does learn something like a, a robust latent space that you can then use for batch integration, the example that I showed you before, but many other things as well. So in this example, for example, we've been using PBMC data each of the color denoting a cell type. And we've been really squeezing it down to two dimensions. In practice, you usually just go like 100 or something like that. But if you really go to two dimensions, those two latent dimensions actually really pretty much look like a TSNI embedding, right? I mean, you see homogeneity with respect to cell type. So this latent space, this bottleneck, like gives you something like a parametric 
new map if you want. So it learns structure and the data. This is really making a lot of hope for me that we can actually then give additional constraints to this learning technique to maybe learn variation. For example, uh, with this STGen method, we've been trying to now use in this case a generative model to understand perturbations. For example, drug perturbation or some, something like that. I also use it for, for batch removal, actually works very well. For example, here we have again PBMC data sets in a control as well as a stimulated situation. And then we removed one cell type in the stimulus. Then we asked, can we predict this population, not only the mean, but the whole variation? So can we generate samples from that without actually having access to this, but knowing how other cell types have responded to that? In this case, pure signature learning is not doing the job because there's going to be a nonlinear answer to our problem. But we found in the latent space was linear. So actually, we do this type of learning, and in this one, we do a linear transformation. This was actually working out well. So we've been really liking those latent space learning techniques. And if you're also liking it because you can extend them now, because you know, your network's very flexible, so you can extend it also multi omics, spatial, and so on, it's, it's useful, right? So let me show you as, as one example how we've been trying to use this technique now to you to really learn a reference atlas. So you know I, I showed you this this slide before in HCA we want to build these things, but there are challenges actually with, with generating those latent spaces, business references. How do you map your own data on top of a reference? How do you really make sure that you don't use bias variability? We try to quantify this. How do we deal with reference data sets that are all, 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 all around the, the world? For example, this, this this COVID analysis we've been trying to do. Well, a lot of data sets that people weren't even allowed to share. So you actually need to analyze locally. So we've been trying to think the current way how people analyze data, namely just getting all the reference data on top of their own system, integrating with their own one, this can't be the most scalable version for the future. I think in the future, it's like as we do in, uh, um, in uh, DNA, assembly, we don't do assembly all the time from the beginning. We just map on top of a reference genome, right? Here we also don't want to build each time again a new embedding, a new annotation for each of the data sets as we do nowadays. We want to automate this process. How can we make those maps uh, accessible? How do, can, we, can we do this in robust fashion? For this one, essentially we need to build a reference embedding across all of these data sets and then map a query on top of that. How can you do this robustly? And I think for this one, the trick is that essentially you need to use transfer learning. Just as a simple visualization, transfer learning means that if you have a data set one and you have then learned something, for example, embedding, and you have a, a second data set, you just do it again. This is sort of the modus operandi in, um, in, in many ways of how we do single cell analysis. You just do it sort of again and again. And we've been doing this in the lab as well. But in transfer learning, you actually take then this one here and you sort of transfer the knowledge. And we've been doing this for imaging. I just skipped that now. But how can we do this now for our reference to query mapping? So how can we basically, once we've been learning this one map, without looking at the original data again, just use this knowledge to do a new one. This is the idea of what we call SCRGIS, which stands for Single Cell Architectural Surgery. This is work by, by Mo, a very talented PhD in the lab, uh, where we've been taking a bunch of public reference data sets and been taking those now, pre-train a reference model so take all of these, make this autoencoder in this case, but adding also the reference language. We, take what, we do what's called a conditional rational autoencoder. The conditions being that we can now map back to each of the studies and make sure that here we, we, we basically remove the study effect. So we learn a reference, for example, a, a PBMC reference across different labs or a lung reference as we try to do now. Once we have this, we can now upload, not the data, because you know, we're maybe not allowed to share the data, but, but just this reference maps, just this embedding to model repository. And once we have all this model repository, we can try to see how we can transfer it, for example, to disease situation, to potentially be species, but at least across different studies. So now we have a new query data set, we add now those query labels, and that's why we call it architectural surgery, because now we need to connect those query labels to the neural network as we had before. That gives you new connections. Now you can ask, which ones of those do you keep fixed and trained? And we've been benchmarking this. But essentially, we do, we add this adapter, we do surgery on the network. And then we maybe add additional adapters. We can upload those adapters. But we can then sort of adapt this network. So that's our transfer learning. So we don't learn everything. We just learn a part of it. Let me show you that this actually works. In this case, we look at a data set from, it's like a sort of a use case that people always show in data integration uh, from pancreas. So we have, we have a bunch of, 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 of cells that without any integration, just cluster by study, as you would expect. No nice homogeneity. If you now learn this, this joint reference, you see now cell types are integrated and sort of studies are all over. 
But we left out the alpha cells. You can see there's no alpha cells there, just to make this sort of a little bit harder. Now we do a first round of SC arches and add actually a cell C2 data set, which we didn't have in there before, with also a hard sort of alpha cells. And you see that it integrates nicely. Alpha cells are being put to a new location where only this, this type is in there. We do a second round of smart SIG2, and again, those alpha cells are being integrated there. Rest looks homogeneous. So you can actually learn a joint map from that. This was, of course, an easy example. So let's see how this works in a bit more robust fashion. We've been doing all kinds of benchmarking and trying to see which type of uh, things start up there. I think the nicest part of it is that you don't need to run a big new, newly generated neural network, but because of only these adapters being able to learn in one layer, we showed that I think it's like two orders of magnitude less parameters than a full integration. It still performs comparably. So we've been trying to, to, to apply this to uh, a COVID-19 data set. This case from for lung uh, lavage. There was, was a published data set where we've been trying to map this now on top of a reference. We built a map for reference by ourselves, you know, we just took a bunch of data sets. Obviously we took lung data sets where we thought there might be some sort of a BBMC bone marrow data sets. We just integrated all of these and then added this query data set at this bell. Now, we saw that this path integrates, doesn't integrate everywhere, but it sort of sits in a few positions. And we had actually annotation in the data set from there were both moderate COVID-19 as well as severe COVID-19 patients in the data set, I think two or three each only. And we can, of course, because we have this annotation from each of the reference, we can very quickly see where they are now co-located. You see the big part of the cells are actually co-located in the macrophages. If you zoom, zoom in what's going on there, you actually see so this is just like twice the, the same picture. You see that, for example, FAT P4 is activated in this one. So this means that these are tissue resident uh, macrophages and they're actually act, uh, active only more than the moderate ones. Where actually, so in fact, they actually sort of a little bit also seek CL10 positive, which tells you that they're sort of, uh, sort of specific type of tissue resident ones, whereas those severe ones are associated to monocyte uh, associated macrophages. You can also see a, a second part of, of, of cells up, up there in the CD8 positive T cells, and you see that they're actually aggregated mostly towards lung samples here. So those cells are lung, but they actually have an active marker ISG. So we very quickly recapitulate a lot of biology that, that sort of was more hard to get without this integration. The last thing I want to say about this SE arches is that this transfer learning idea is so nicely general that you can actually do more with it. For example, you can actually apply this and, and, and try to learn multimodal references. In this case, we bunched up and, uh, with, with, with this NIRS, NIRS lab uh, who have this tool called Total VI, because the surgery is like a generic approach. We, we, do, we can we do this architecture surgery, whatever type of neural network embedding thing that you want to do. So we did this for this Total VI, which can learn both RNA as well as uh, protein expression, this, this side seek type of data can learn embedding from that. So in this case, we learn now on a reference data set, PBMCs, both RNA and protein from SiteSeq. This was, I think, just reference from 10X or something like that. And then we have a query data set where we only had RNA. But because we have this joint data representation, we can query RNA and then impute the protein expression for those RNA and those imputed expressions actually made much sense. So that's, I think, quite useful. If at some point we have a very detailed reference, even though we don't have all the information for our query cells, we can sort of get the other stuff just for free. I think that could be very powerful also with our targets on data sets coming out now, very, very high uh, um, throughput. Last uh, sort of tool I, I want to mention uh, sort of on the technical side is that when doing all of these things, we, we, we realized that many of, 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 of the students sort of had a separate folder of data lying around. And also for the benchmarking, we've been pulling some things, but then for a new methods paper, again, we've been putting the few, a few data sets together. I think it would be really nice to have the sort of reproducible, easy access to annotated single set data sets and also train network models to really benchmark things very quickly, but then also to try out new things, maybe to map your own data, uh, sort of to have this, these, these, these models quickly around. For this, we build up what we call the model zoom. I think this is something that's very popular already in, for example, I mean, machine learning for sure, but also, for example, in bulk genomics, this thing called Kipoi. I don't know if you saw that from Anshul and uh, Junior Gagneur, who've been, uh, Anshul Kundaja and Junior Gagneur, who've been doing this for sequence-based learning methods. We've been trying to, to sort of set something similar up for single-cell RNA-seq models, particularly your network models, uh, worked by David and, 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 and Jan, and we just brought out the bioarchive uh, a few weeks ago. And where we've been trying to sort of get those in there. The idea being you have your count matrices, 
you have a data loader, and then you sort of represent these end data objects. This is sort of our internal representation in ScanPy. And then you can learn a network on top of that and sort of have it use it for visualization, for prediction, for annotation, and, and so on. And then you can add your own data without contributing it to this whole thing, just because you have it locally. So it's nicely decoupled. You have the, the cloud with all the public data sets and you have your own local ones. And then you have a very easy API to access those things. You have an API for the data sets, for the models, as well as, and you can have your own inputs there, as well as an API of the parameters of those models that you can then actually share. So you can reuse parameters if someone trained this model, such as the SDR, just one that you showed before, but many others as well. You can actually share, share those quickly. So this far essentially has data sets, presentation, models, and parameters, and sort of can give you very quick training. Let me just show you what's in there at the moment. I think this has been expanding already a little bit, but at the moment it's 240 data sets that are in there, three or so million cells across 55 organs in both mouse as well as uh, a human. And you see that there's obviously a different number of data sets. For example, we have a lot of line data sets because we've been sort of looking at those, but this is sort of always expanding. And you cannot very quickly just get, for example, all human cells in a screen in scan by screen very quickly or from a particular uh, type type of tissue and so on. So this is, and this has a homogenized annotation as well. For example, you cannot plot here cell types versus, versus the number of cells that you actually have. And you observe that, for example, many cell types in kidney, whereas maybe not so many annotated in lung, but a lot of cells. So you, you can sort of do some easy statistics of this thing, but you can also load those easily and you can work with those. What would you do with that? Well, besides the method benchmarking that, that I mentioned before, my, my vision really is for this, that the standard SC, single cell RSC workflow is just sort of every time again, doing pre-processing, doing PCA, doing a clustering, doing annotation, that takes a lot of time. And even if you're not a very experienced bioinformatician, at least in my lab, this takes, I, I mean, a few days for sure. I mean, if you know the organ system and so on, you might be sort of in, in a day, but that's, and that, it still always has an, an analyst bias. It's sort of not as easy reproducible and, and so on. With Fire, we have those things pre-learned, pre right? They might not always fit perfectly, so you might need to do a little bit, but essentially we can just take those Fire embeddings and you speed up from, let's say, a day to just a minute. We just apply it, essentially. And just to show you that this works, in this case for, for PBMCs, if you do a manual embedding of, of PBMCs and versus this Fire embedding, you see sort of similar clusters. And if you now use Fire to annotate, you sort of get the same type of annotation as you would manually get. So you can really speed up those workflows. Sometimes you have maybe a more coarse grain annotation because you don't find this particular setup. So you might still sort of zoom in and then find, I don't see positive, see for positive T cells because they haven't been made initially annotated, but that's sort of the general idea. But also for method development, I think this is super useful. So in this case, we've been asking ourselves, what type of priors can we add to latency-based learning? There have been some ideas of just not just making a normal autoencoder, but for example, adding variational, and this is sort of uh, these, these, these inverse flows, or also uh, what's called a vamp prior, which is a variation mixture of posteriors. And you've been just trying this out, and, and the student, you know, at, 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 at a recent ICMI workshop, been sort of trying this out not on a single data set, but across three or five different tissues in very straightforward fashion without not going into details will be found. Now, this is something you can sort of very quickly get. So I think if you're coming from a theoretical community, maybe you sort of don't want to, you don't understand how to get your hands very quickly dirty with this data set, this could maybe facilitate that. All right. So with this, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly at the end. I just, I, I think I have sort of four more minutes, Nancy, if, if I'm right with my count. So let me just say two more things that I wanted to say. One thing the lab is, is sort of investing now is really adding spatial information to ScanPy. Uh, for this one, Giovanni, but pretty much the, the whole team can come up with tools for data integration. So not adding RNA as well, spatial positioning, finding then spatial clusters, doing all of this robustly in ScanPy. Some stuff has been pushed out. Some of it is still in tool chain, but someone wants to use it. Just, just approach us. We'll be hopefully bring it out within the next one or two months. We can generate a spatial graph and then sort of do neighborhood-based enrichment tests. Or we can also use really the image features that maybe are sort of there in the neighboring slice. So I think adding spatial information to all that is going to be a lot of fun. And we've been applying this to also study now variation in, uh, for example, uh, across organoids. Actually, I skipped that because it's, it's sort of maybe not, not the key, key focus here. But you, know, you can now use these spatial latent space learning techniques also for other things. The second part, the second sort of small outlook I wanted to give is that you can also, you know, you have this, this multi-omics uh, 
thing that's happening now is sort of really happening very broadly across different things where you can get and we spoke about dna sync just with the with the, with the uh, grad schools and postdocs before right but you get uh, also uh, side seek information so protein information you get epitope or information on the surface so there's a lot of stuff that you can actually do with this so how do you deal with this multi-view type of data sets and i think for that these new network based things are very useful because multi view learning is something that's very common in machine learning. For example, we've been coming up with something which we call T cell match that used T cell uh, um, single cell readouts, multi omics ones to actually use this to predict uh, epitope specificity and uh, something which we just, just brought out. Just one thing I, I wanted to mention for, for that, that I think is something that has been a bit understudied, is that you can actually use this additional slice through the data that goes beyond the RNA to learn about some things. For example, in this case, this is work with Kilian Schuber from TUM, who's now transitioning to Würzburg. If we try to predict, uh, to, to identify antigen specific T cells using a technique which you call reverse phenotypy. So we had, in addition to the RNA, we had T cell receptor sequences, and we tried to leverage those to sort of find groups of similar cells. So in this case, we said, let's say we have our T cell phenotypes, effector cells, memory cells, and so on, an unstimulated condition, and then you have a stimulus. In our case, stimulus was then COVID-19, but whatever, right? And you can now say, okay, we find some reactive T cells here that are maybe interesting. We want to see where they have been located in the unstimulated case. And for this, we can now use chronotype information. So for example, if one of the chronotypes is actually in this bunch of cells in the stimulus that's interested. With this, we can actually select now unstimulated ones. So we can sort of reversely phenotype them and then find what's differential here between those. So that's sort of using this additional directionality, this sort of orthogonal information in uh, that space that gives, uh, in this case, come from T cell receptor clusters. And we've been using this, this technique to characterize unsimulated reactive T cells. We've been doing this actually for SARS-CoV-2 reactive T cells. So we've been looking at COVID-19 uh, COVID ICU patients. We extracted uh, peripheral blood but then actually stimulate this because the actual original response usually is, is then not as dominant as, as you'd like them to be. And then we, we find basically stimulated as unstimulated conditions. And then we have our T cell types. You always find CD4, CD8 T cells, but you find this sort of one cluster here that's sort of those more active ones. This is something that we actually really found a lot of interest in. And then we were actually able to map those back with, with chronotypes and yeah, characterize those. Actually, I, 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 I don't want to go into detail of this. We've just brought out on, on Met Archive as well. But I, I think that was sort of stuff really interesting. We've been able to use this now and apply this also to cohort data. Let me conclude. I've been trying to show you that so you have those small scale, single gene type of models that, that can help you learn about dynamics in the data. You can then ask us on the whole big latent space learning things, use it for data integration or to transfer learning. Then we've been trying to, to, to come up with some type of, of tools for uh, building model and, and data zoos. I think this outlook, I think spatial data is going to be very interesting as well as multi-omics data and then trying to interpret those, those, those things. This is a, a picture of how it always looks in, in Bavaria, beautiful mountains. This was a, so still our somewhat spatially separated last group mini retreat. Um, I thank you very much for attention and really looking forward to taking questions. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Fabian. Uh, any questions? Uh, you can either type them in the chat or you can just uh, shout them out. Maybe I'll stop sharing my screen. Huh? I have a question. Actually, you know, I want to ask you about the, the, the model zoo, the, um, the last work you, you described. I forgot the name. Um, yeah. You have these, the data integration uh asphera asphera um yeah. is that how do you actually integrate the different data sets in there do you is it based on your SCRGIS work or is it initially we, we there's so there, there for, for the first thing there was no conditional integration or anything like that so for that we really did because actually learning an, a, a robust atlas across all those different organs was completely beyond our uh at times. So the only integration what we did was that we made a shared annotation tree, which was actually quite some work. So you know, there's a big discussion in the community, what type of cell types you really specifically want to call. So we came up with a hierarchical version where we can map sort of differently annotated public data sets on, on top of each other. 
but then only le learned without any batch correction, um, um, all of this. And we were hoping that data set, if at some point you have enough variation across all uh, across cells of a, of a one organ, then these axes of lab variation versus uh, biology variation will naturally come out. We didn't do I any see. joint bedding. Of course, you can now add SCR to the top of that, but we haven't done that. I see. I see. So it's based on this kind of expert curated kind of labels that you. Exactly. So, so the, the main part is really you have joint annotation for this. You have those, those, those joint embeddings, but you would still, so this, there's no batch correction or something like that added there. So if you want to do this for your particular question, you actually need to do this on top of it, but you can use it, for example, for quick auto annotation of the data set. I see. Uh, can I, you know, maybe use more of your time and ask another question? Uh, so um, we looked at your SE Arches paper, and if you know, uh, this is a little technical question. So in there, you have a, a conditional variation on autoencoder, I believe, right? Where you have this um, these these adapters that you know, and then there you 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 learn this, you train this deep neural network. Um, using a sort of this new criterion function where you where you penalize you want it's sort of like you you have these reference labels and then you know you want to make the Z uh, the the latent space batch free or, or um, label free so you sort of have this cool way of training this network to sort of enforce that uh, batch freeness of this latent space, right? Yeah. So you... which was which was not our original. So, so, so this part here, this was not our key idea. This was what people, for example, SCBI also did already before. Right. So our, our main contribution was was really this part. But yes, uh, what I tried to indicate with you can see my slide, right? Yeah, I can see. So, so, so what I tried. What I try to indicate here with the reference label, so you add each of those references as additional input. Mm -hmm. And when you do this, you can learn this. We, we had, we had at, at some point, we've been trying out to actually penalize this in addition. So we had something like a minimum mm -hmm. mean discrepancy type of, of, of constraint on top of that with this TLVAE. Turned out this was not super necessary. So in, in this case, we used actually this additional MMD constraint. Yeah. But was it was better. adding a little bit, but but I think that's already doing a, a well enough job. I see. I see. I was just wondering how much does that MME and this this uh, MD, yeah. that actually matter. it's costly, right? So it adds additional thing. Um, it performs well, and it's. I think it's always with these new network type of things, right? Yeah, because uh, I think it add a little bit, and but it, it's cost, but it, it works. Uh, Okay, because that was not in SCVI, but it was it was new. No, no, that's true. That's true. That was new. yeah. So, so, and I think in SC Arches, you're right. In SC Arches, I mean, this this thing is general. So, so that's why with with me and now we actually added also an SCVI version of, of that. You know, you can basically just throw in any kind. I mean, there's all kinds of constraints. There was this uh, Smita's lab also adding additional constraints to these things. I mean, the idea of of engineering in additional nodes that's sort of a generic thing. We've been implementing it for the MMD one, you're right, and, and for the SCBI one. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you have if you have a, a different type of architecture that, that you want to add on top of it, I think it should be rather straightforward to, to add this idea. So we've been trying to make this somewhat generic. And we've mm -hmm. been actually transitioning now the whole code from, from SC Arches, which was an original intensive flow now to PyTorch, which might make it a bit easier to use. I don't know what, 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 what you use. I see, I see. Uh, I have a question. Sorry, so uh, does it work now? Okay, so uh, my question is that uh, uh, for the stimulation uh, part, uh, does the uh, in the does the cell type specific effect encoded in the latent space or specifically modeled as a cell type specific vector? Uh, so, so uh, because I guess different cell types will have uh, different uh, like uh, effect under stimulation. So uh, I wonder, is it 
like how is it in, encoded yeah this this is a, this is a very very good point so right if if everything was linear and we just add a vector here so you know if if we just add here i mean essentially this means adding a vector right and this was sort of related to what we did in sc gen just so well not on this level but here but essentially we sort of just shift things you would think that a, a linear transformation would actually sort of apply things similarly to each local part in latent space thereby not being allowed to sort of make make it turn around but because all of this is being transformed through this thing it actually turns out that linear vector space arithmetics in latent space and as a gen for example we're actually doing a robust in, in enough job actually we've been extending this a little bit i spoke with with nancy before that i think there may be more clever ways to do that but here as well you know, here we've been trying in addition to just just you know in this case they have always be, all been pre-trained we only learn those few edges we've been comparing this by learning all of the input layer as well as all learning the whole network again uh -huh. and it turns out for us adjusting all the weights did not improve much in fact it, it sometimes also learned to overtrain you so over believing in this thing so i think this is an effect that people learn have been seeing in transfer learning often that whenever let's say you you, you use some features from ImageNet in computer vision and try to make your own prediction it does not make sense to preach to retrain the whole thing you just adapt a few layers in this case here also also worked of course this might be data set specific so if you have your own one and it's maybe sufficiently complex you might need to pre-train more but for us uh, at least currently it was really fine just to have this one layer and the nice thing is if it's just the input layer then and that's what we indicate with this adapter image it means only those things need to be adapted and that's why it actually doesn't matter the, the order doesn't matter so you can actually swap things around and it's still commutative so it has some nice mathematical properties as well very often, if you integrate a first and b first it's different from b and a but mm -hmm. if you do this it doesn't actually matter mm -hmm. which is kind of nice mm -hmm. so uh, you modular basically you modularized the components of the yeah. network right yeah. i guess because you know, of this sort of simple approach yeah Chin's, Chin, following up on Chin's question, I thought it's really interesting how, you know, everything becomes linear in that latent space when you, when you just basically add a vector or subtract a vector from to, 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 to do this kind of transfer learning. Um, is it because, I mean, is it because of the specific prior assumptions, if the Nancy, I think you dropped off, I can't hear. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, can you hear me now? Okay, so I was wondering, um, in, you know, following up with Chin's question, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the the fact that you are able to perform things linearly on this latent space yeah. in order to transfer between yeah. conditions, is that because of the fact that you are using a variational variational auto? You're having that that variational um, sort of constraint on the linear space to sort of make things Gaussian? Is that the intuition behind that? I, I'm not sure I can speculate on that. So, I, so we got this idea from checking what people have been doing in computer vision. There, this thing has been often called style transfer domain adaptation. So I'm sure you've seen this, right? When, when people I don't know, I take a, a painting from some famous painter and then make sort of a natural scene also with this, this, with this style and so on. They've been essentially just doing in this first simple version. The, the better ones then been used, been using GANs for that. But in the first ones, they've been using autoencoders and then essentially doing the spectral space arithmetic. So they've been just sort of experimentally observing the things are linear. In our case, we, we, we saw this as well, but I don't think this actually holds across also more subtle conditions. We had this discussion. I think there are some conditions where this actually really breaks, right. but for some cases it did work. You know? And we can actually test for this as well. So I think it's important to make sure that this holds. So in this SCR, just we have a small test for, for giving you some uncertainty of the predictions. I see. Oh, I see a question um, in the chat, uh, or two questions in the chat. Uh, the first one from uh, Chu, uh, it's a great talk. Uh, recently, there are more and more methods capturing both chromatin features and gene expression. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on single cell multi-modal multi -omic, multi omics data analysis? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I try to say something about that in the end. So I very much agree. I think I think is 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 a big topic, and there will be uh, there's 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 really more more happening there. And I mean, you you mentioned open chromatin, but yeah, I really like this plot. I'm, I'm sure you you saw this also. Can you can you see this slide? You saw this from from this this uh, nature mathematics thing. Yeah. And there's like so many techniques. I mean, it's crazy, right? I mean, it's like not all of them commercial, so I don't think we will see all of them. But but yeah, I don't know. Have, have have you guys seen this this yeah. uh, development data set from Coltrap now with this uh, combinatorial indexing where we had the sphere and he has sort of the dark side of chromatin and the light side of expression. Oh, yeah, 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 this beautiful animation. That was crazy. Uh, yeah, we, we need to face these things. How do we deal with that? Um, I guess current approach is mostly really, I mean, we, we spoke about this briefly before, right? We just sort of try to map chromatin by some type of gene expression score. I think this is actually not really the way to go. And at some point, the more and more match data we see, I think we can learn this. Again, as a pre-trained model and then transport this. So I, I showed this only briefly for side seek data. Mm -hmm. I hope I wasn't too quick with that, but you know, here I, I think this is quite a, quite a, quite exciting. So here you learn on on coupled data, you learn an, uh, an embedding, and then you have uncoupled data, and you can sort of impute the rest, right? Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be happening at some point as well. You know, we we learn those anchors on a coupled data set. You know, from 10x, there's this combined attacker and RNA protocol coming out, and then you have uncoupled data, and you can just sort of see, it. and then we can test if those simple approaches, the gene-based mapping, are the right ones or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Nancy or if someone else has additional comments on that. I think this is more like a discussion because we haven't been actually trying so much on that. But if there are comments for, from the audience, I'd be very interested to hear. Interesting point. But, but we, have, we have two more questions. So maybe because we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to ask. We're short on time. Yeah, sorry for that. Yeah, I'm going to sorry. ask quickly and so maybe you, you, you have time to brief, uh, briefly answer them. So the question from Trang, uh, have you seen variation using different similarity metrics? in pseudo temporal ordering. Uh, do you have any suggestions for obtaining robust results? Yeah, I mean, we've been doing the benchmark for the data integration. There we've been trying out a whole bunch of metrics. I think for the metrics for pseudo time, I would really refer to this uh, even science benchmark. This, this uh, I think it was Nature Biotech paper uh, two years or so ago. I think that's very robust and this is a good bunch of, of benchmark and indices. And then there's the, the, the second question that I see here is uh, uh, from Michael Balzac, um, great talk. I couldn't help but notice the complexity of the kidney compared to any other organ. I, yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, that was strange, right? Strange, yeah. Uh, in your opinion, is cell type heterogeneity a hurdle or a chance for data integration? Oh, oh, for sure. It, uh, okay, very great. I think I think it's 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 fantastic. I think it's a very big chance. So, so I think one of the simplest take homes that, that I I really want to very strongly make is if everything was if there was not much variation, I mean our field I guess wouldn't exist. You know if 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 it, it, let's say for some reason all those methods had those, those experimental methods had been put out, and we, it always turns out that we get a bulk RNA and then then a, a Gaussian blob around it. I don't think that would be much reason for us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for sure we we really like cell type heterogeneity, and it's it's an opportunity. To be honest, why I mean I haven't really looked much in, in kidneys, so I can't really comment strongly on that. Sometimes you know people have to maybe just annotate in one thing because you know this. I mean all this idea of a cell type is a human made construct. You know, it's just like a cluster, and you have know, people annotating them. And mm -hmm. if you go on Wikipedia and check what what how many clusters are, are cell types are in the brain, Wikipedia tells you like nine. But then you go to Stan Linnison or, 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 or Alan Brain, and there's like a thousand different clusters. So, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's it's a feature, I would say. Yep, <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> I, well, I think uh, there's I don't see any more questions. If you have any questions, it's the last chance to shout them out. Um, if not, then let's, uh, let's give Fabian another round of applause and thank him for, for his wonderful talk. And uh, see you guys. And thanks. Yeah. Thank you again for the invitation and for the really nice discussion. Too bad we can't be in Philadelphia. I heard you guys have good food. Uh, should be a nice place maybe at some point when you're allowed to travel again. Next time, this gives us an excuse to invite you again.
All right. Great yeah. seeing you. Bye. Bye.